my main impetus uh, for engaging in non-monogamy is, you know, some people it's love, you know, some people it's a variety of things. For me, it's freedom. You know, I like having the maximum amount of freedom that can be afforded to me. I like being able to make choices for myself about what I do with my affection, what I do with my time, what I do with my body, what I do with my desire. Um, and I don't want anyone else making those uh, uh, choices for me or some arbitrary rule hanging in the air that says that, you know, you can't do this. I, you know, I only want that to come from me. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy. Welcome to episode 229. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have a wonderful interview with Evita. She is a personal coach, an educator, a speaker, and has been non-monogamous for almost 10 years. We have a wide-ranging conversation with her, and we're so excited to get this episode out to all of you. Yeah, one of the other things that we really loved about this conversation was the discussion we had around transitioning relationships. And so a big sort of theme of this is the transition that her and her husband went through, going from uh, well, from monogamous to swinging to polyamory and how their relationship has changed and how sort of everything changed. And what's also kind of exciting about this is that a piece of this was captured on a documentary that is on uh, Amazon called Poly Love. And so links to that documentary are in the show notes as well. So you can check that out. So we're super excited about this conversation and just wanted to extend a huge amount of gratitude to Evita for coming on, sharing her story and being super vulnerable with us. And for all of the work that you do. Before we jump into the interview with Evita, we do have a couple of quick announcements. First up, a huge thank you to our incredible Patreon community. We're so grateful for each and every one of you. And we have over 200 members now and continuing to grow, which is amazing. If you're out there looking for like-minded people, we'd highly recommend that you check out our community. We have ongoing Mimi chats. We have monthly men's groups and women's groups calls, as well as monthly Q&As. To find out more, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the Patreon button. The other thing we have for Patreon coming up are two uh, Patreon-only meet and greets we're doing. We're going to do one in L.A. in a couple of weeks on April 11th, and we're going to do another one in San Francisco on either April 17th or 18th. We just kind of planned these and then realized that April 17th is Easter. <laughs> we had no idea. So we're kind of gauging the community to see. So uh, if you're not part of the Patreon community, you could definitely check it out. It's an opportunity to come meet us in person. If you are part of the Patreon community and you haven't checked your email and seen this yet, go check your email, send us some feedback so we know when and where and how we can see you. Yes. And if you're not part of the Patreon community and you're not interested in that for whatever reason, uh, we won't judge you too much. But we do have other events coming up. We have in-person events as well. We have two this week in San Diego, one tonight. That's March 30th. We have a meet and greet tonight. And then we have another event on this coming Saturday, April 2nd, also in San Diego. It's a um play party with a strategic play coach. Um, it's going to be in Balboa Park. So not not the type of play that you're probably thinking of, but it's going to be lots of fun, improv, um, and just a blast. So we highly recommend you go check that out. Again, on our website, under community events, you can find all of the information. And after those events, we don't really have anything else on the calendar in-person event-wise other than the special Patreon dinners. Uh, until September, we're doing, uh, we had rescheduled our pool party that we were supposed to have in February, but uh, Omicron messed that all up. So that has been rescheduled in New Orleans for September 17th. And also on that same day, we're going to do a high ropes course, uh, sort of team building, group building event. So both of those events are going to be on, eight, uh, geez, not April 17th, <laughs> September 17th. So you can find out more information about those and any other events we have coming up on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the community events tab. You'll also find there some virtual events. Yeah, a quick 
plug for our virtual events as well. We have virtual trivia coming up on Friday, April 22nd, and a virtual meet and greet coming up on Saturday, April 23rd. We will have more virtual events in May. Uh, Again, these are open to anyone. You just must be open-minded and uh, respectful to join all the information on our website per normal. Yes. And while you're there, the last thing we would recommend you do is reach out to us, send us an email, send us a voicemail. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what you think of the show. Uh, Maybe you've come to an event and you want to give us some feedback. Maybe you want to come to an event. Maybe you want to help us host an event. Anything you want to reach out to us about, we'd be happy to hear from you and we will email you back or send you a voicemail back. So again, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, click on the About Us tab and you can contact us there. And Also, on the podcast tab, you'll find podcast show notes for this episode, everything we talk about with Evita, photos of Evita, plus all of our other guests, links to all of their episodes and show notes and anything we've ever talked about on the show ever from the beginning four years ago. So check that out. And we will see you on the other side of this interview with Evita. Yeah, let's go. Um, Go for it. Welcome to the show, Evita. We're excited to have you here. And we're excited to learn more about you and have a good time talking. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So um, I love talking about uh, my non-monogamy and, and how that works for me and just hearing other people's stories. And um, it's, it's, I always enjoy those conversations. So I'm really glad to be here. Yeah. Wonderful. We're pumped. And we, we got introduced to you not that long ago. And so we don't know hardly anything about you. So do you mind introducing yourself and we will figure out where to go from there? Sure. So my name is Avita Sawyers. Uh, some people know me as Lavita Loca. Um, I am a bisexual mother of three. I have been a non-monogamous now for close to a decade. So um, I think I come up on, um, uh, uh, 10 years, finally, officially in 2023. Um, I, uh, am a polyamorous educator, content creator, um, peer support guide. Um, uh, I also am the subject of the documentary poly love, um, which chronicles the, uh, my first non-monogamous relationship, which was my foray into polyamory. Um, I entered into non-monogamy, um, at the, with my then husband at the time, uh, he and I are now currently separating, but um, at the time we were uh, still together. Um, and we actually started with swinging. So uh, I am bisexual, like I said. Um, and um, at the time when we got into non-monogamy, uh, we were actually going through a pediatric cancer. So one of my children got diagnosed with brain cancer when he was six. Life was really, really tough. He's alive. I always forget to like include that. And so people are like, what happened <laughs> Thank to you. Him? Yeah. Right. Everybody's like, they're like waiting with bated breath. And I'm like, oh, he's fine. Like, you know, so he's 15 now. He's a normal kid. But, um, but yeah, so uh, we were going through this like pediatric cancer. Life was really, really hard. Um, and uh, we kind of needed just, you know, some escape. Um, and I was wanting to get an opportunity to um, explore my sexuality. Um, I got married very young. Uh, my husband, I was 21 when I got married. My husband was 22 and I was in the military. I was in the United States Navy uh, before I got married. And at that time, uh, being uh, gay in the Navy uh, or in the military was um, not allowed. Um, and so I really didn't get an opportunity from like discovering, you know, that I had a queer identity of some kind to actually exploring what that queer identity was. I just didn't get that opportunity. Um, and then I got into this monogamous marriage with this man, um, but I still had all of these feelings. Um, and so we got into swinging to kind of get away from, um, life as we, you know, were experiencing it. Um, and then my husband had a lot of like, you know, kind of sexual hangups and things, uh, that, you know, I was like, you know what, let's just have some fun. Let's do something kooky. And so, uh, and so we got into, uh, swinging and that was our like foray into non-monogamy. Um, that was back in 2013. Uh, before that, we were very monogamous. Uh, we met in church. We had this really, really conservative uh, marriage. I was an at- at-home mom. He was the breadwinner. And so uh, so this was a, a complete 180 from how we initially started our marriage, uh, which actually goes into probably why we're separating. I always say that we like married, we got married to be on a trajectory that we like hadn't been on in years and no longer sort of worked for the people that we had developed into. And so that necessitated us to kind of need to to um, end our marriage. But 
that time, uh, we started with uh, non-monogamy with swinging. And for my husband, swinging was very challenging um, because he, I would probably say that he's a lot more demisexual. He needs some kind of emotional connection with a person, maybe not to experience sexual attraction to them, but to feel comfortable engaging in sex with them. Recreational sex was always a challenge for him. Whereas for me, I can literally sleep with somebody whose name I don't even know and just did this weekend, actually. So I'm a hundred percent honest. Um, and so, um, and so swinging was very easy for me. I thrived in the swinger environment, uh, but it was really a struggle for him. And so we went to a party one day, a woman came in with her boyfriend and then her husband came in later on and they were just talking to each other, hanging out, shooting the shit. And it like blew our minds because we didn't even know that that was a thing. And it was very appealing to my husband. because, Like I said, he wanted the opportunity to form emotional bonds with people. Mm -hmm. Whereas at that point in time in my non-monogamous journey, I largely considered myself sexually non-monogamous. So I liked having a variety of sexual partners, uh, but I didn't really feel a necessity to develop emotional bonds or romantic bonds with other people. My view of relationships at that time was that your body is just a shell, you know, so kind of what you do with your body with other people uh, is, you know, just I, I, I tell people I look at sex, sex is like, to me, it's, it's like any other bodily function that we engage in for the most part. We eat, we go to the bathroom, you know, we sleep. Um, that's kind of the way I viewed uh, sex. You know, I more attach the meaning of sex onto the person that I'm actually having it with, but the actual act itself, um, you know, I don't attach a lot of meaning to it. But things like your heart, your emotions, your affection, your regard, like those were things that I very much felt like were mine, you know, and didn't want to share uh, with anyone else. Um, and so, uh, so initially I bristled at the um, idea of us becoming, you know, romantically and emotionally uh, non-monogamous. Um, and so we tried it. Um, I went on a date. He went on a date. I lost my shit. <laughs> and, um, and so we tabled it and was just like, okay, we're not going to be able to do this. Um, and that was about six months. And then um, we began to reintroduce the conversation because I wanted the opportunity to be able to have romantic relationships with women. Up until that point, I had only had sexual interactions with women because we were just swinging. Uh, but I wanted to the opportunity to be able to have the experience of actually having a woman as a partner. Um, and so we reopened up the idea of us becoming non-monogamous. And it's actually really funny because most couples that are comprised of a heterosexual man and a bisexual women, woman are usually going into non-monogamy, seeking a triad. That's kind of what you normally see. But we actually did not do that. Uh, we were, I, there, I literally was like, there is no way that we're going to find a woman that we both like because we have such different tastes in women. And so I was just like, but, like let's not even set ourselves up for that failure. Um, and so we were like, we're going to go and uh, find our own person to be with. And then weirdly enough, we uh, went to a swinger party and uh, met a woman who became our partner for uh, off and on for uh, two years, which is actually uh, the uh, relationship that's the subject of the documentary that I was talking about. And, um, and that was our entrance into polyamory. Um, so that was the first time that we were in a relationship where we had actual feelings and we were in a partnership and, you know, it was someone that was, uh, uh, you know, a romantic partner of ours. It was highly volatile. Uh, none of us had any experience with this. Um, and so we were all just, I always say we were just kind of fucking up each other, you know? Um, and so it did not go well. <laughs> Him and her had a much, uh, they got along a lot better uh, than she and I did. They were much more suited for each other than she and I did. And at the time I didn't possess the, like, the, I, did, I hadn't gotten to the place to where like I could be like, oh, okay, well y'all go ahead and be in a relationship. You know, she and I, we're just not working. Y'all go ahead and do your thing. Uh, I wasn't really there at that space. Although when we did break up, uh, finally, uh, she and I, um, they did attempt to uh, stay together, but that didn't last uh, so long because, like I said, it was so volatile. And uh, and we started the triad closed. And then weirdly enough, so like I said, this origin story is very different than what you normally see. Uh, my husband and I were the ones that were like, no, we think we should open this thing. So I was really the main one that pushed for like, you know, I don't want this to be closed. Um, and she was actually resistant to that uh, because I was like, you know, we didn't 
open up our relationship just to meet you. You know, we opened up our relationship because we wanted the freedom to be in open relationships. And so why would we exist in a capacity where we now shut ourselves off to interacting with other people? And so we transitioned to being an open triad. Uh, but then, you know, we broke up not too long after that. And then once that, you know, relationship was over, uh, we just were open. You know, so from that point on, my husband and I engaged in a variety of relationships, long distance relationships, local partners. I was actually ended up in another triad, um, but I was the third. So I dated a married couple for a period of time and I started off dating uh, the husband for about seven or eight months. And then me and his wife developed feelings for each other. And then we became a triad. And so I've just had, you know, various constellations of partners. And so has my husband. And then um, in 2020, um, that was when my husband made the decision that, you know, he didn't want to be married, uh, us to be in a, a marital relationship anymore. And so now we're kind of focusing on, you know, having a co-parent relationship and what that looks like. And then how I got to be uh, a content creator and the person that I am, you know, today is um, I would be in, uh, when I got into non-monogamy, I was struggling. Okay. So um, I was jealous. I mean, I was going through it. Okay. <laughs> Attachment <laughs> style activated, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Triggered. I was going through it. And so I began to join Facebook groups because I was like, I need some help. I need some people to talk to. I need some people to interact with and then find out how people do this. You know, you know, what am I doing wrong here? Because everybody's, you know, talking about compersion, all this stuff. And I, that was just not my experience. I'm going through it. And so, um, so I joined a bunch of Facebook groups and was trying to find the community and find people to interact with. And I noticed that really nobody was really talking about the challenges that they were experiencing. Um, uh, most of the, it, the post was just, oh, you know, I'm just so happy. You know, my partner is in France for three weeks with this super hot supermodel that they're dating. And I don't feel anything about that. And I was just like, uh what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how do you get there? Okay. Because that is not my experience. Um, and so I started talking, you know, about the challenges that I was facing, um, which initially received a lot of pushback. I remember one of the very first posts that I made in this group that I was in. I, uh, so at the time we lived in a two bedroom apartment and our partner at the time lived with her grandmother and her cousin. So like she could never host. Um, and so she always came over to our place and she would spend, you know, days, you know, at our house. And uh, we had a queen size bed. It was not large enough for the three of us. And so what we would do is when she would stay over is we would alternate who's, who got to sleep on the couch because we wanted to be equitable, you know, so we didn't want to make her sleep on the couch all the time. And so we would rotate. So I'd sleep on the couch. My husband would sleep on the couch. You know, she'd sleep on the couch. And obviously, you know, people get alone time in the bedroom. You know, they're going to do what they do, you know, and it wasn't a big apartment, you know, <laughs> So you could hear what was going on. And I made a post um, asking about if it was okay for me to ask my partners if they would mind keeping it down when they were being sexual because it was really hard for me to, you know, be out there hearing them, you know, uh, you know, getting busy. And I wasn't involved. And um, man, they attacked me so vehemently you know, <laughs> about uh, me wanting to be controlling and, you know, you're limiting their self-expression and all of this stuff that I literally, I broke down and cried. Because yeah. um, I was just like, I'm struggling with this. I don't feel comfortable in my own home. These people are in my room. They're doing this thing that I'm really struggling with. And all I'm trying to ask for is a little consideration here. And people were treating me like I was this like childish, controlling person, you know, for wanting to make this request for this consideration. Um, and so I began to really like have a, a, a like a a commitment to, no, I'm going to be honest about this. You know, I'm going to be honest about what I'm experiencing. I'm going to talk about, you know, it not being, you know, roses and cupcakes and rainbows and compersion all the time. Um, I used to, I would talk about my, my, my process through my emotions and, you know, the thoughts that came forward and, and what I realized about myself um, when I would go through things. Um, and it really started to resonate with people. And so I would get people. And at first it would just be people popping in my inbox and saying, you know, I'm really glad you made that post because I went through something similar, you know, yep, and, yep. um, and that kind of stuff. Um, and then it sort of, I created kind of a name, you know, for myself as someone who will talk about, you know, the real nitty gritty of what it's like being in these relationships. And so then people began to seek me out and go, Hey, like, you know, can, can I talk to you about this? You know, I'm, I'm going through this thing with my partner, you know, can I run this by you? And at first it was just me doing it for friends and people that I knew. Um, occasionally, like I said, I might have a random person pop into my inbox and, you know, kind of ask me questions or ask me for advice. And, um, and so then, um, you know, then would people reach out for me for podcasts? And then I was also very open 
Um, very, very open, very loud. You know, I was very honest about the fact that I was polyamorous. I never felt the need to conceal it or hide it. And I was fortunate enough and privileged enough that I lived a life where I could, uh, you know, be very open and out about it. Um, and, um, you know, and especially as a black person, as a black polyamorous person, that's major uh, because, you know, we face so much more censure for living alternative lifestyles uh, than non-black people. So even just the fact of me being black and being very open about the fact that I was polyamorous was very revolutionary. And so, you know, people began to kind of reach out and say, oh, you know, would you be willing to come and do this podcast or, you know, kind of talk to me about this? Um, and then, you know, once we did the documentary, which interestingly enough, the documentary was about the triad and uh, there was supposed to be another polyamorous configuration in the documentary, but they pulled out last minute. And so they, you know, focused it on us. And then what happened was uh, maybe two days before uh, she was set to start filming, we broke up. <laughs> oh, no. Yes. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> two days. Two days before she was set to start filming, we broke up. And, um, and but I'm actually really glad it happened because it, 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 it shows it's, it's very unique. It's a very unique documentary in that it's not just like, oh, this is what polyamory looks like. And this is this person going on a date and blah, 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 blah. And everybody's laying in the bed in the cuddle puddle. Like, it's, it's not like that. It's a it's a very real portrayal of like, you know, the challenges um, of being in these kinds of relationships. Um, and we ended up getting back together like a couple of weeks later. But yeah, so um, so once I did the documentary, you know, that gave me some notoriety. And so um, I got invited to speak at a couple of, you know, conferences. So I did Poly Dallas Millennium. Um, I did Polytopia in uh, Portland. Um, I did Black Poly Pride Weekend, which was in Dallas. And then uh, when the pandemic hit, and then I had like a page, you know, for myself. And I would occasionally post things, but nothing that, you know, serious. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, I like challenged myself, like, you know, can you do like a daily polyamory reminder, you know, and see if you can amass like 365 of these for a year. Um, and that's really where like it like kind of took off. And, um, you know, people started, you know, kind of finding my content um, and appreciating it. And I think just that there was a black queer voice uh, that was speaking about non-monogamy, you know, because so much of the public face of non-monogamy and the voices, the public voices of non-monogamy um, are usually non-black or white. And um, and so, yeah, and so that's kind of my origin story. And like I said, in 2020, my husband and I separated. Um, and then um, I was living in California at the time. I moved uh, to New Jersey. So that's actually where I'm based at now. And then now currently, um, I have two partners. Um, I have a partner um, named Marquise, and then I have a partner named Julian, who's a newish partner. We've been together for less than a year. Uh, Marquise and I have been together for a little over two years. Um, and then they have other partners. So Marquise has, a, a, you know, he has a he has a wife, and then he has his other partner. Um, and then Julian also has uh, two other partners. Um, and I have wonderful relationships with my metamors also. They're great people. And so now I have this like really sweet kind of polycule of these like amazing human beings that I deeply appreciate. And so, yeah, it's been quite a journey. Wow. Wow. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, I guess and, we'll just wrap it up there. <laughs> have, a, have, a, have a great afternoon. It was, it was wonderful talking. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that incredible journey. Uh, and oh, man, so many questions. I I wanted to start, I guess, back at the beginning because I have a, as you were talking a while ago now, many minutes ago, um, <laughs> about you said that you and your husband, uh, or now I guess ex-husband, um, got married really young and you were very conservative, did all, you know, you met in the church or, or close to the church or something in like church. that. And so yeah, you, in the, in, in the, in church. Yeah. So you had that very conservative upbringing. How did you, I don't know, even encounter non-monogamy in the first place? Where, when, how did that conversation start? So it's so funny because most couples have an origin story of somebody like presenting it to the other person and saying, hey, I'm interested in this. I want to try it. We do not have that, actually. It was all these really random little events that brought us to this place. So I always tell people that we evolved to this place. And jokingly, what I tell people um, that started our non-monogamous journey is a 2 Chain song. So 2 Chains is a rapper um, and he has a song called Birthday Song. And there's a lyric in the song that goes, y'all been together 10 years, you deserve a menage, especially if you put that B&W in her garage, you know? And so my husband would say that to me jokingly and I would tell him, well, you ain't gave me no BMW, you know what I mean? So we haven't done this yet, you know, we're not doing this. But like, that was, that's kind of the joke of like how we got started. But I was, so the first thing that we did was 
we went to the strip club together on Valentine's Day with my sister, incidentally. <laughs> and uh, I tell people, yes. <laughs> so we went to the strip club together with my sister on Valentine's Day. And I tell people the joke, we were tax time balling, you know, so we got our little tax return. And so we was like, we're going to make it rain, you know, in the strip club and whatever. And, uh, and so we went to the strip club and um, my husband got a lap dance. Uh, I got a lap dance. And I remember watching him get the lap dance and I just wasn't bothered, you know, like I thought I would be. Um, I was just like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> and that was kind of it, you know? And so, so that was like the very first thing we did. And so then we were like, okay, you know, and this is kind of a little bit more traditional. We were like, all right, we want a threesome, you know? But we had no idea even how to go about doing that. And I'm really glad that like we didn't like get a picture of non-monogamy like before we did this. Cause even though we didn't know what we were doing, we actually sort of kind of went about it in the way that I, I, you know, say that, you know, couples that are looking for that experience should do. We, we were looking into getting a sex worker. So we were like, okay, well, how do we get a sex worker, you know, to do this? And so, um, and so we looked into maybe going to one of the, um, uh, brothels in, um, Nevada. Um, but it was way too expensive. We were like, okay, we just cannot afford this. And so then we went on like another website. Um, I don't remember what it was. Um, it's definitely before Foster Sesta. So, <laughs> and, so um, and so we were looking into a website and like, you know, trying to see if we can find someone that we can sort of pay to have this experience. And that didn't work out. Um, and then I was in a group uh, in San Diego for bisexual women on Meetup. And I noticed that one of the members in the group were in a different group called adult only games or something like that. And so, you know, it's kind of a swinger group where people get together and they do like adult games and whatever. And so, uh, but they weren't accepting new members. And so I kind of reached out to them and go, Hey, I don't know if you know, it's, you know, you're not accepting new members. Um, and they were like, Oh, you know, I just took the group over and I didn't know that. And we'll change the setting. And they never changed the setting. So I don't know if they just said that because they didn't want me in the group, which is entirely possible. <laughs> but but um, <laughs> like at first I was just like, oh, okay. And then they never did. And like looking back on it years later, I was like, I think they did that on purpose. But, um, but anyway, so, um, and, but it suggested a similar group. Okay. And so, um, and so I was like, Oh, okay, well let me join this group. And so I joined this group and, um, they posted that they were having a party. So I was like, Oh, Okay. And so I told my husband, I was like, hey, let's go to this party. Um, and we were still looking to have this experience. You know, we were still looking to, you know, kind of have the threesome experience. So we were like, all right, well, let's go to this party. And um, and it was funny. It was like way out in the sticks um, in San Diego. There's this uh, guy in San Diego. He's got a ton of money. He was like in his 70s. And he just loved to open up his house so people could come in and fuck. Like, that really, he was just a dirty old man. Okay. <laughs> he just loved to open up his house. He had this huge mansion. And he just loved to open up his house so people could come in and go to these parties. And so uh, I didn't know anybody there, didn't know anything about the party. My husband has social anxiety. And so we're driving out and we're in, like, I'm telling you, it's in the desert. And he's just like, what are we doing? Like, are we driving to our death? You know? And he was like, you don't know anybody here? And I was like, no, you know? And, and so I'm, I'm Adventure Bay, you know? So I'm just like, shit, why not? You know? And so, so we go out there um, and um, uh, the, this woman, I remember she opens the door naked and we're just like, you know? <laughs> and, uh, right. and so we go inside and um, it's actually really funny because um, I very much went into it with this mindset that like I, at that time I weighed about 330 to 350 pounds. I was much larger than I am now. And so um, and I lived in San Diego, which is a predominantly white area. And so so the white gays and, you know, desirability politics and all of those things are going on. And so in my mind, I'm just like, nobody's going to want to interact with me. Um, it's just going to be, you know, me and my husband. And so I just didn't go in thinking, you know, that we were going to do anything, you know? And so, and so me and my husband kind of talked about it and we kind of discussed the ground rules. And at the time, like we were like, okay, you know, I, he was, I wasn't comfortable with uh, us kissing anybody because I thought kissing was intimate uh, and I didn't want him going down on anybody and he didn't want me sleeping with any men. So that was the ground rules. We threw all the rules out by the time the party was over. I don't know if it was blaming on the goose. Okay. You know, <laughs> I got you feeling loose. Um, uh, but, uh, by the end of the party, all the rules were just gone, you know? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and so we get inside, we're interacting with the people, we meet this couple and, uh, I'm attracted to the, uh, the woman and I'm like, Oh, you know, this is somebody that I want to interact with. And we were very much new to swinging and they were like older and swinging. So, you know, there, there's this thing with new couples to where it's like, they're not full swap and you know, all of that stuff, you know? And so we very much like fell into that, you know, category um, and, um, and so, uh, we meet this couple there. Um, I was really, really interested in the woman and the couple. I remember we were sitting in the garage and someone came in and just started, you know, uh, fingering her. 
And um, and I was so like, oh my goodness, like I was just like, uh, you know, and I'm not approved by any stretch of the word, but there was something about being there to witness that that was like really, really challenging for me. And so I'm like standing in the corner, like, you know, should I be watching this kind of like a little kid? Whereas my husband was totally into it. Like he was just like, oh yeah, this is great. And, um, and so, uh, but she, she, uh, had an orgasm and she had like the best orgasm face and she just, she just looked so beautiful when she was orgasming. And I was like, oh my God, I have to make her make that face. So I like told my <laughs> husband, I was like, can you go tell her, you know, that, um, that I want to like play with her. Like, and I like pushed him. I was like, go, you know? <laughs> be my, be my wingman. Right? Like, go, go. You know? And so he walks up there and he tells her and she's like, yeah, you know? Um, and so, and so we played with her and it was wonderful. Um, and then this other gentleman came, um, and, um, he asked to play with me and I wasn't even super like into him, but I was so into the fact that he like really wanted me. Cause like I said, I really felt like I was going to go to that party and nobody was going to interact with me. And he was just like, you are so beautiful. Like, I really want to, you know, sleep with you. And so I went to my husband and I was like, Hey, like there's this guy here. He kind of wants to sleep with me. I kind of want to do it. Like, can we have a conversation about this? And he was like, okay, well, you got to let me go down on people and kiss them. And I was like, all right, bet. You know, and then that was kind of it. <laughs> I was like, all right, bye. And so, um, and so I went off and, you know, I played with this guy um, and uh, we had a really good time. Um, and then, you know, you know, my husband got to do what he got to do. And then from that point, we were kind of open. And actually I accredit uh, swinging to um, making me comfortable with my body. Um, because at the time, uh, like I said, I was much larger. I had gastric bypass surgery in 2016. And so that's why you see me in this frame that I'm in now. Uh, but before that, I was all very large and very large for most of my adult life. And so while I was a confident uh, uh, big woman, you know, I dressed how I wanted to, um, you know, was stylish and all of those things. But I never really thought of myself as being able to put the label of sexy you know, onto me, you know, that's not something that I thought that I could, you know, say, or I was like, I feel like I'm sexy, but I didn't think like anybody else, you know, did except maybe my husband. So, um, and even then sometimes I really didn't think he thought I was sexy if we're being entirely honest. So, um, and so, um, so when I started swinging, I just knew that when I got into the community that I was really going to struggle to find people to interact with. And that was the furthest thing from the truth. Like, you know, uh, I was always, you know, had people to interact with. I never struggled to find partners. And so uh, I, I accredit swinging with really helping me to accept my body and to be able to say, no, I am sexy. I can be sexy. Even at 330 pounds, I can be sexy. And so I'm always, I feel very deeply indebted to swinging for giving me uh, the permission to, to own my sexiness and to think of myself as a, as a sexual creature um, and someone that's worthy of desire. Uh, because that was just not something that I, I experienced or thought about myself uh, before I got into it. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's how we got into it. And so the couple that we met at the party, they started having parties at their place. And so they introduced us to their swinger community. And, uh, and so that's kind of how we became, you know, in the milieu of the swinger community in San Diego. And so we were kind of like a little, I wouldn't say like a family, but we we're like a little, you know, community. And so, you know, you see the yeah. same people at the parties and, you know, you might interact with somebody for like one-on-one -on -one play. And then, you know, we joined a couple of groups on Facebook as we found people, um, and so yeah. that's kind of how we, we, we got into, uh, swinging. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And I should just caveat, we don't recommend doing what you did and like throwing the rules out the window because, <laughs> because that, that's not always a good thing. However, sometimes it works and sometimes it's the push you both need. So, right. I don't, well, I definitely like, don't recommend that. I definitely think things need a lot more negotiation. Like I said, <laughs> we had been drinking, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so you know. Um, I definitely do, would not recommend that. I do think that those things should be negotiated off screen. Um, <laughs> I definitely do feel that way. But in our case, it did happen to work. But I, we are the anomaly. Okay, we're not right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. and I, I think that's a great point. And like, it worked for you, and you had fun, and you had a great time, and it showed you so much. But I think you know that the advice that often gets thrown out is like, you can you can change the rules, but don't like if you go into an experience saying we're going to do. X, Y, and Z, you don't introduce A, B, and C in the middle of it. You come out of it and you say like, hey, that was great, but I would I would also like to do these other things next time. But to, to cause it can like, right? Perhaps you didn't really want him to go down on women and kiss women. And you're like, well, but I, but if I can get sex, like, all right, I'll, I'll sacrifice what I want, what I need, what I feel safe with to get what I want. And then afterwards, maybe nobody feels good. So there's a, there's like a big risk there, but like, it, right. And you, know, too, you don't know what emotions are going to come forward um, when something sure. like that happens. And 
it, it's very high stakes in the actual moment. Mm-hmm. So um, at least if you have a conversation about it after the fact, you can get a chance to sit with how you think you yep. might feel, you know, have conversations around where those sticky areas are coming up for you. You know, I'm really feeling some discomfort around this thought, around this thing that you want to do. But in the moment, it, 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 it can go sideways, you know, very, sure. very quickly. And oftentimes you, when you're just triggered, that's it. So, um, so it's definitely not something that I would recommend by any stretch of the word. It just so happened uh, to work yeah. out for us. But like I said, we're definitely the anomaly um, and not the rule. And it's definitely not something that I would recommend. Yeah, no, and I appreciate the vulnerability on that. And like, it's a hell of a story. So thank you for sharing it. And yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think it, it does kind of maybe lead into to a question that I, I was thinking back, you were talking about sort of your approach to sex with other people and that you're totally cool, like anonymous one night stand don't really need the emotion or or at least at that point um but your husband had a little bit of a different tact on it and when you when he sort of brought up the idea of like well let, can we introduce emotions you kind of push that away but then you were also the one to like reintroduce it and maybe like if if you could sort of dig into a little bit of like how how you came around to like wanting to go down that path of like introducing the emotion and then you also said that like you're deep in it and compersion isn't easy for you, or at least it wasn't. And jealousy came up and all these things and that there were a lot of challenges, but you still went for it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that like is, is important to pick apart. Like this isn't easy. Some days it's really fucking hard. A lot of days it's really fucking hard, but like here we are still doing it 10 years later. You got your plaque from the board of directors of swinging and non-monogamy <laughs> for your for your 10 year anniversary. Ours is still, we're, we've been waiting for six years for ours to come in the mail. So one of these days it'll get here, but yeah. So, um, I think that we needed a period of like, I, I feel like I needed to feel secure maybe that he wasn't going anywhere. And so I, th- I think I just needed a little bit more time to kind of wrap my mind around, you know, him being in a relationship with someone else. And then also I didn't really desire that uh, at the time when he introduced it, you know, I, it wasn't a desire that I had, which I will say, and I tell couples this all the time, you don't have to practice the same non-monogamy that your partner practices, you know? So if you are just largely interested in having mostly sexual relationships, whereas your partner wants emotional connections, you know, that is something that can be negotiated, you know, because you should be showing up to non-monogamy in a way that, that is authentic to how you want to engage in it, you know, but at that time, you know, we were so deeply entrenched in m- monogamy um, that I felt like we had to be doing the same thing at the same time with each other. So if we're swinging, we're doing swinging. If we're doing, you know, uh, emotional, you know, non-monogamy or polyamory, we're doing emotional non-monogamy and polyamory. And at the time I didn't really want to do it. That was just not a desire that I had. And so I was very much going along with it because it was something that he wanted, but it wasn't something that I wanted. And it wasn't until I began to want it myself that I was like, okay, like I was like, you know, I'm willing to uh, uh, open up this conversation and give this a try again, uh, because I very much am um, uh, like a I, one of the things that I say is I try not to take liberties that I'm unwilling to afford. You know, Mm -hmm. so it did not feel right to me to go, Okay, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to develop relationships with women that are emotional and all those things like that. But you don't have uh, the freedom to be able to do that. That didn't feel, you know, it didn't feel fair to me. And so and even even though you knew it was going to be a hell of a lot of work and a and a right. And well, actually, I didn't know what it was going to be like, honestly, I I had no idea, you know, what it was going to be like or how it was going to uh, affect me. And so but it was worth it to get an experience that I wanted. Um, mm-hmm. And really, that is what my what my my main impetus uh, for engaging in non-monogamy is. You know, some people it's love. You know, some people it's a variety of things. For me, it's freedom. You know, I like having the maximum amount of freedom that can be afforded to me. I like being able to make choices for myself about what I do with my affection, what I do with my time, what I do with my body, what I do with my desire. Um, and I don't want anyone else making those uh, uh, choices for me or some arbitrary rule hanging in the air that says that, you know, you can't do this. I, you know, I only want that to come from me and from the people that I'm interacting with, you know, engaging in consensual, you know, uh, relationships with. And so what what drew me to wanting to try is I want to have this experience. You know, this is something that I now want to do. And so since this is something that I now want to do, you know, I, I, I need to be open to my partner wanting to do this because I don't want to be doing this um, and going, but you can't. Um, that doesn't feel um, in alignment with like who I ultimately want to be in relationships to the people that I love. 
Sure. Yeah, and I think it's easy to listen to that and hear somebody being like, well, he wanted to do it and you didn't. And so you didn't. And then all of a sudden you're like, hey, I'm interested and now you're doing it. But to, to be fair, like all that happened, I'm assuming is he said, hey, I'd like to do this. And you're like, I'm not there. I can't like. Right. And, and then you got to a place where you're like, OK, I'm there. I'm interested. And he was still on board. Right. If he had said, hey, no, I'm not there. Like, what would you do you think you would have jumped in anyway? Or would you have said, no, like, okay, well, no, 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 no. Right. I don't think I would have. It, it was very much a collaborative thing. It wasn't yeah. like a like a, well, now I'm going to do this, Um, you know, and uh, if he would have been like, OK, well, no, I'm not, no, I'm not ready. Yeah. then it would have been a, a conversation. You know, it would have been sure. like, okay, mm-hmm. like, what do you need to be ready? What's holding you back? You know, what are you comfortable with? You know, like it, it would have then been a conversation, but it, I would have never been like, oh, well, too bad. You know, um, right. now I'm ready. Yeah. No, that wouldn't been, that would not have been how I responded to that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think it's, it's so easy to hear people be like, well, they just do whatever Evita wants. And like, she said no. And now they're, now she says yes. And they just, but that's, I mean, that's boundaries, right? That's like, I'm not there. I'm not ready. Okay, I'm ready. Where are you at? Okay, I'm ready. Now we're both ready. Like, let's go down the path together. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just wanted to maybe like pick at that a little bit because I think it was important to, to I feel like that. that's a common problem too in non-monogamy, especially with couples enter, in, entering into it is the pacing. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. somebody is always a little slower mm-hmm. than yep. the other person. And you have to go the, somebody- at the speed of the slowest person. Right. Yeah. Go at the speed of the slowest person and sort of like, how do we like, how do we meet each other to where we're going at a pace that might be a little bit fast for the slowest person, but they can keep up and it might be a little bit slow for the other person, but they're not feeling like they're like, like drudging, you know, through it. And so like having that conversation of like, how can we merge, you know, where we're at with regards to like how we want to pace ourselves to do this so that one person isn't feeling like they're being dragged along and the other person doesn't feel like they're being weighed down. Yep. Right. Yeah. And that's super easy to do, right? You just nail it every time. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it, 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 it's it's hard. It, it, it's a, a very, very hard thing to do, especially if you have someone who's a little bit more emotional, um, who is a little bit more sensitive, who, um, you know, maybe has a, an attachment style that's not as secure as the other person is, or even like a, like a power dynamic in a relationship. Cause like in my relationship with my uh, husband, he was a primary breadwinner. You know, I relied on him for survival. So it was far more threatening for something to happen in our relationship, uh, you know, for me than it was for him. Right. So it was a lot easier for him to, you know, be more uh, comfortable with taking risks or things that felt like risks with yeah. our relationship because he wasn't as, you know, afraid of like if our relationship uh, uh, broke up uh, simply like, you know, m- you know, the, my fear was not only do I lose, you know, this person that I love, but I also lose this person who's actually taking care of me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so and so, yeah. And so, you know, people have different um, uh, uh, they have different um like some people are just a little bit more secure in the relationship with the other person. And so they're, they're able to be like, Oh, well, let's just do this thing. And they, they approach it from the space of like not being as, as bothered or as uncomfortable uh, with things or things don't feel as threatening. Whereas another person, they're like terrified, you know, if you go out on a date or, you know, they know that you like another person. And so making sure that we are, like I said, kind of coming together and collaborating with one another so that both people are feeling comfortable in their relationship, not in, completely comfortable because part of non-monogamy is growing edges, you know, and, and having discomforts and, and learning and evolving. Um, and I don't even like to use that term because I feel like, you know, sometimes the non-monogamous community can be like, we're so evolved. And I'm like, no, that's not entirely accurate. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no. So, um, but, but, you know, growing, you know, growing around, growing through some of those discomforts, but like it, there should not, it should not be where one person is like, oh, this is just great. And I'm feeling amazing. And the other person is like, oh, like this is horrible. And I'm dreading every day. You know, when that's the case, you know, something needs to be looked at and addressed. Yeah. 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 And I think and we actually had a guest on the show not that long ago who made the comment that like the, like the, what, what sort of gets put out there in the world of polyamory and monogamy is like, well, if you're not like full of compersion, then you're just, you're not doing it right. And like, sometimes you're like, 
You know what I got right now? What's that? (laughs) Yes, we saw your face. (laughs) Yeah, we saw your face, but but no one else did. It was a it was a hard eye roll. Your eyes came back. Your eyes came back, but they they were gone for a minute. So yeah, but like some days, right? It's like or weeks or years or maybe even just some relationships. It's like the best I've got is like if you're happy, like I can tolerate that. You know, I'm maybe I'm not like gushing over it, but like, hey, you know what? You're doing you and like you you mm-hmm. want this. So like go forth and enjoy that and I will support you. But yeah, I'm not gonna like throw you a party with a cake every time you come home from your dates. Like that may that may not be where we ever get and and that that's okay. Right. I always tell people um that one of the things that I realized early on, I remember, I'll never forget it, we were in the triad and my husband and our partner at the time went on their first official date by themselves. And, you know, I'd been in these poly grooves and you're supposed to feel all wonderful about this and blah, 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 blah. And so I took a picture of them and posted on Instagram. They're going on their first date. I'm so excited. And it was all bullshit, all bullshit, all bullshit. I didn't feel any of it. Okay. I was faking it to make it and didn't make it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. um, and it, it, <laughs> and like, it sucks, but like, it's so true. Like it can happen. Like <laughs> right. I was faking it to make it, didn't make it. It imploded horribly. And so, yeah. And so what I tell people is we live in this monogamous society that tells us that if your partner has someone that they love in this way, or they want to interact with this way, or they desire in this other way, there's either something wrong with them, something wrong with you, Something wrong with the other person or something wrong with the relationship or a combination of all four of those things, you know? And that's the message that we're constantly receiving. Mm -hmm. So having this expectation that you're going to get into non-monogamy and just immediately feel wonderful about your partner being with another person is naive at best. So um, not to say that that's not the experience of some person, because some people do have that experience, but that those people are generally, they're not the anomaly. They're not the rule. You know, most people, we struggle a little bit with this because we've never gotten any images that this is okay, that this is something that's good. And so I tell people, you know, going from this is something bad, this is something that you should feel bad about to then going, this is something that you should feel good about. It's too, it's too lofty of a goal. It, and it skips so much space. So I, I, I tell people I, I very quickly on, I'm like, I need to just get to work on arriving at indifference, mm-hmm. get to the middle space to where I don't feel good or bad about it. Yeah. It just is, yeah. you know? And then once I get to a space of indifference, then I can go, how do I want to feel about this? Where do I want to go with this? And that like, like, so, and that was what I did. So I, I spent years really just getting to the space of I'm indifferent. You know, my partner's going on a date, whatever. You know, and then once I got there, then I was kind of go, okay. now, how do you want to feel about this? Can we maybe move the needle a little bit more towards positivity? What are some Mm -hmm. things, some benefits Mm -hmm. that you can see about this, whatever? And then, you know, and then I started to do that work. But like, I, you know, I I, after just getting bust upside the head a couple of times, it's like trying to, you know, get to 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 happiness and just not getting there. And then you you feel bad about yourself and I can't do this and I'm terrible and blah, 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 blah and all this stuff. Um, after a while, I was like, okay, this ain't it. Like, I was like, this ain't the move. This ain't the the thing to do. And so I was like, maybe let me just try to get to just being neutral mm-hmm. about this. And then once I get to neutrality, then I can kind of figure out where I can go with this. And so that's kind of where it is. I'm not a person that naturally experiences compersion. Um, uh, I, I have experienced compersion. I definitely do experience it a lot more that I've been doing this uh, for a, a long period of time. Um, some of that was personal work. Uh, some of that is I have wonderful metamors that I really care about. And so it's easy to feel compersion because now I have two people that I love and care about that are engaging in love with one another. And I want good things for them both. Some of that has to do with some of the relationships that I was in, which I think people often don't talk about. Is they're like, oh, you're just supposed to feel compersion just across the board. I'm like, okay, but if you have a partner who you're not, you know, the relationship is doesn't feel good for you or whatever, compersion is going to be a lot harder to come by because you don't feel like you're fulfilled in that relationship. So some of it is that needing to be in relationships that allowed me the room to feel compersion because I felt so fulfilled in the relationship with the people that I was in. But I, I, I always tell people that if that's where you want to go or that's what you want to have, you want to have compersion, great. That's fantastic. If all you can get to is my partner's on a date today, feeling a little crunchy about it, but I support them being happy, even if I'm not always jazzed about the ways in which they choose to get there. Right. Yes. <laughs> then, you know what? You're doing okay. But you yeah. know, that's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, we want the people we love to be happy, right? Right. So you 
Yeah. And we're not always happy about the ways in which they're happy. Sometimes the people that were happy, they're happy about eating stinky cheese that makes them have really bad gas, you know? <laughs> You're and, like, come on. And we hate that they eat that cheese. And we hate that they, you know, that, that they get that gas and we got to go to bed. And we're like, you ate that cheese again, girl, you know? <laughs> but would we like tell them never eat that cheese? You know, I don't want you to be, no. Like, you know what I mean? So some of the ways in which our partners choose to make them happy, we're not always super jazzed about. Yeah. But do we want our partners to be happy? And do we want them to have the freedom to pursue that happiness? Absolutely. And so if you can arrive at that space, then I feel like you're good to go. And if you never get to a space to where you've experienced compersion, um, I don't believe that that's necessary in order for you to live a healthy non-monogamous lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah and, and to that sort of building on that, like it, it made me think your, your stinky cheese example made me think sort of of um, the conversation you brought up about boundaries and being on the couch and the, in the rotating um, sleeping arrangement. And I think you know, where you got, you got jumped on by everybody in the Facebook chat room or the Facebook group, um, Instagram, chat whatever room, it was, chat room, <laughs> was it your AOL was instant Facebook. messenger, how, how, how old am I sounding <laughs> now? Um, but, um, the, like what you were doing really is, is just setting a boundary for yourself, right? You weren't saying like, Hey, don't, but like, Hey, if I'm going to be out here on the couch, like, could, could we have a little bit of respect or right? Like p- potentially the conversation is like, okay, well you can't then like I'm on these nights, like I'm going to take our child and we're going to go bowling for two hours and you can be the loudest raunchiest sex you guys want to have. And then when we come back and I'm sleeping on the couch, like you can keep going, but maybe keep it down. Like, can we find a way that this works for everybody? Actually, what I ended up doing was I would just go to sleep with headphones, you know, you when I slept on the couch. So, um, so, uh, I, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to take my headphones to bed. Yep. Um, and when I sleep on the couch, I'll put my headphones in and I'll cut my music on. And, um, and then that way I'm oblivious to, uh, what's happening, um, in the room. And so that's what I actually started doing. And so we did find something that worked. Right. Um, but it's, it's being willing to ask the question and say, hey, or even to say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Can yep. we collaborate yep. on yeah. something that you're willing to do that also shows that you have care for me and this thing that I'm struggling with? Because I'm not telling you you can't do this. I wasn't trying to say, OK, if I'm not in the room with you guys, you guys are not allowed to have sex. I'm just like, hey, I'm really struggling with this. Is there anything that you're willing to do to help me mitigate some yep. of that struggle? And they totally had the right to say, no, you know, right? we don't want to yeah. do this. Um, and then I would have had to deal with that and kind of figure out something, you know, else that worked for me, which I ended up doing. Um, but I feel like people uh, act like just even asking for the consideration is wrong. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I don't really subscribe to that. I tell people you can ask for anything you want to ask for in a relationship. Don't mean you're going to get it. Those like, but you can show sure ask, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, if you identify that something as a need. Right. It goes it. back to like basic human consideration, compassion and cooperation and working together and like that's all those are all foundations of a relationship right i always tell people i'm not responsible for your feelings but if i claim to care about you then i should care that you are struggling you know or that i should care that you're going through something and if there's something that i can do that isn't too much of an imposition on me that i'm willing to do that i'm willing to offer you that can bring you some ease Mm -hmm. as you're navigating this space why would I not want to do that? Or why would I not want to work with you to find what that is, you know, as part of my care for you? Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and you're, you're exactly right. Like you can ask for whatever, right? And your partners could have said like, nope, that's how we do it. We're going to do it like this and you have to figure it out. And then that's on you then to be like, well, uh, again, I can either figure out a solution or do I want to be with these people, right? Like if that's their approach, like your approach is like, well, what could we do? Like, okay, maybe we take some steps to make it a little bit quieter and maybe you take some steps on your end and then everybody's working together to make it work. But if if somebody's like, nope, nothing I can do here, then it's like, you get to choose. Like, do I want to continue doing this? Or like, do I want to be the one always making the concessions or is this not the right right dynamic? And And it sounds like kind of an extreme step, but like, if they're not willing or they don't want to, and that's a boundary that they don't feel they want to move and you don't want to move yours, like it may just be an incompatibility at the end of the day. Right. You're at an impasse. And that's something that is so important. And I talk to people about all the time is, is, is making sure that we are in alignment with Mm -hmm. the people that we're in relationships with. So there is very much a crowd of non-monogamous people that they're like, your feelings are completely your own. I don't have to do anything to, to, you know, help you with them or whatever. And, you know, we can argue back and forth whether or not that's right, wrong, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I don't get into those things. I go, then those people need to be with people that also feel that same way Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because then they will have that understanding of one another. 
Mm -hmm. And then when those things come up, they won't be making those requests because they have that understanding of one another. And people that don't mind making concessions, that don't mind doing considerations, that feel like that should be a collaborative thing. Those people need to be in relationship with those kinds of people because we'll be in sync and we'll be in alignment, you know. And so and that was definitely something that was at work in my relationship with my uh, husband is he tends to fall into that other category of person, you know. Um, to where it's like, I don't really want to have to do a whole lot to help you with your emotions. I gotcha. And so asking for considerations was a constant battle mm-hmm, um, right. and a constant struggle. Um, and eventually it was just like, okay, like, like I literally said, okay, you need to do non-monogamy with somebody who has way less emotions than I do about this. And I need to do non-monogamy with people that don't mind that I have emotions about this and also have emotions about this because we'll understand that about one another. And which brings me to another point that just because you can do monogamy well with a person does not mean that you can do non-monogamy well with a person. And so we did monogamy very well together, but non-monogamy no, 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 no. And we would even say that to each other. It was like, if we met each other now in our non-monogamous selves and tried to be in relationship with each other, we would absolutely not choose one another for the other person because the way we want to navigate and move through it was not compatible. Um, and so, yeah. And so like making sure now my focus is when I get into uh, new relationships is, is making sure that I'm with people that I'm in alignment with. How do you feel about me sharing about my discomforts? You know, is that something that you want to hear? Um, how, what are your views on, you know, if I ask for considerations, like uh, these are, you know, conversations that I'm having, you know, with people that I'm interacting with so that I'm making sure that I'm choosing people that, you know, we're in alignment about those, those core things that I feel like I need to be in relationship with someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I have a question on that because I think the, the question that comes up often or the criticism, I think is a better term that comes up often is like, well, yeah, look, you and your husband are separating. So obviously non-monogamy was the reason. And you almost basically just said like, we, we couldn't do non-monogamy well, or yeah, we did monogamy well, non-monogamy didn't work. So in some ways it sounds like that may have been the end result. And so I think the question that I have is, and I was, as you were talking, I was trying to think of the best way to ask it, like not like, Hey, if you could go back in time and do it again, would you do it the same way? And I know that there's like, yeah, you'd probably change this, that, or the other, like, you know, things you said, little bits and pieces, but would you still go through the process of like having a monogamous relationship with this person and then opening it and then arriving where you did like that trajectory would you do that again or would you go back and be like, uh, we should have never been together because non-monogamy wasn't going to work for us and we're both non-monogamous people. So therefore, that time is just we should have never done it to begin with. This is such an interesting question. I love this question um, because I actually asked my husband this when he broke up with me. I was like, was it worth it? You know? Okay. Yeah. Um, And he said, yeah. He said that for himself it was. And I toggle back and forth, you know, with how with what that answer is for me. But what I tell people, because, you know, obviously you hear that, you know, we're breaking up, non-monogamy doesn't work. It's because you guys came in on monogamous. And I always tell people, I'm like, I don't know if there is an alternate reality somewhere where we didn't become non-monogamous and we actually broke up five years sooner. Yeah. Yeah. I literally don't know that. Yep. Yeah. And what I feel like non-monogamy did is it didn't break us up. I feel like people give non-monogamy way more power <laughs> than it actually has. I feel like it didn't break us up. What I feel like is it what it, it did is it made it more stark how incompatible we were for each other, which is something that was true when we walked down the aisle March 7th, 2004. It but was you could, true then. Yeah, but you could it hide it under monogamy. Major. Yeah. But you can hide it under monogamy because we were only engaging in relationship with each other. And so the mindset was just, well, this is just what relationships are like. You know, they're hard. They're challenging. They're difficult. You got to, you know, and all of that stuff. But when we started engaging with other people, it's like, oh, these ways that we want to be in relationship, these things that we value in relationship, they're available. Just not with this person. Yeah. 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 And we weren't aware of that until we got into non-monogamy. So it didn't create something that wasn't already there is that we were very incompatible for each other. And we were from day one. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was always true about our relationship, even as we were monogamous and we had a wonderful marriage and all of those things. But it was always a hard relationship. It It always felt like trying to make the East meet the West. I'm loud. He's quiet. 
I'm public and all out there. He's super private. Yeah. I'm a big extrovert. He's an introvert. Like we had so many areas where we just were not in a lot. I love being out and adventuring. He's a homebody. All he wants to do is stay home. Like we even had a joke in our marriage where um, say we'd go out to eat and uh, we'd order an appetizer and uh, you know, he'd take some and I'd take some. And I'd be like, oh my God, this is really good. You know? And he'd be like, oh, I didn't really like it all that much. And I'd go, that's because I liked it. Because that's how opposite we were. Right. Um, he had, I had a very high sex drive. He had a very low sex drive. I mean, there was just so many ways, you know, that, that we just were not compatible for one another. And so non-monogamy didn't, all it did was make that very stark. It made it very stark. And it also made us aware that it's like, we can be in relationships with people where we have these things, you know, in common and these things are there. It just ain't going to happen between us. Right. And for a while we just did that. Well, we don't need it to happen between us because we have all these other people, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, okay, well, we don't need these things to happen between us. But then it, then as time progressed, I think what happened was the reality was because we were married and we were nested and we had kids, we spent the bulk of our relationship time with each other mm -hmm. just by way of the life that we had, you know, uh, set up with one another. And for us to spend the bulk of our relationship time with each other, so many of our core relationship needs were just not met in that relationship for both of us, for him and for me. And after a while, I think he just, he was like, you know, he, he wanted off. He was yeah. like, you know, and, uh, you know, and I would have rolled that thing till, 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 the, till the wheels fell off, you know, because that's the kind of person that I am. And, and um, I remember something that he said to me when he was breaking up, uh, when he broke up with me, um, that blew my mind. He said, I have never had what you needed emotionally. He said, and I believe that you are going to find a relationship with someone that can give you these things that you need. I believe that for you that you're going to, you know, you're going to find yourself in relationships where you can get this thing that you need. And it blew my mind because I said, I, I said to myself, you know, he held a standard of happiness for me that I didn't even hold for myself. Yeah. Because I was totally fine with knocking against the wall for the rest of my life. And I was okay with that. And he was just like, he, I, I think he, he saw me struggling and he saw himself struggling and he was like, you know what, you, you know, we just, we need to pull the plug. And, um, and while it was absolutely painful and it's still painful, I literally was listening to breakup music last night crying. Uh, but do I believe he made the right choice? Absolutely. I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it gets back to that thing too, that the saying that just because our relationship ends doesn't mean it was a bad relationship, right? Like or it, a fail. Or, or a that failure, it that it was a failure. Like, because your relationship ended, there's still so much beauty there to that relationship. And the years that you had together and you had children and there's, there's, there's a lot there. And so, um, it doesn't mean it's not painful, it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> but, but there is, it, it does, I just want to be clear. Like it, it's not a failure. Um, yeah. I, I, I tell people that the way I describe it is our relationship reached its statute of viability, you know, or it's limit of viability, you know? Yeah. So it, 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 it reached every, every relationship has a shelf life, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, it reached its shelf life. It reached its limit of viability. And that was something that I actually struggled with because it was so painful mm -hmm. that I, I, you, you begin to, to, to rewrite history in your mind mm -hmm. to where you're like, I have to make this relationship bad somewhere. I have to look for where it was bad because because that that it, that almost feels like that will help me make sense with the fact that it's ending. Mm -hmm. Because if it was good and it was beautiful and it's ending, there's a cognitive dissonance there. You mm -hmm. know, especially as human beings, you know, we want things to be permanent. You know, especially if they're good, we want them. To, the The best things are, you know, the 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 products that that you know are the the most highly regarded, the ones that last forever. You know what I mean? And the ones that last a really long time. You know, and so it's like this relationship was good. And so why is it ending? And so there's this weird cognitive dissonance there. And so I began to kind of rewrite history in my mind and go back and look at all the ways that it was it was terrible or uh, sort of paint this picture of it as ugly. And interestingly enough, um, I read a book by Catherine Woodward Thomas called uh, Conscious Uncoupling. And she had a quote in there that I can't remember, but it was basically saying like, you know, devaluing love loss is like looking at a like a beautiful garden. And like, you know, turning it into like a field of like cheap plastic flowers, you know, and um, and I did a, a, a like a, a guided um, plant medicine um, journey once. Um, and um, when I was doing the journey, um, I was uh, I remember like having this vision of this like beautiful sky. Um, and it was like all these like pretty billowy clouds. And I remember the colors I can even see it in my mind so clearly right now. And they were like blue and purple and 
orange and it was like this gorgeous, almost like a, like a sunset sky, you know, when the colors are just bursting all over the clouds and it's really beautiful. And I was up in the sky and, um, and, uh, uh, like, I feel like spirit spoke to me and it said to me, it was like, don't you dare like tarnish the image of your marriage, you know, by now, like making it out to be this horrible, ugly thing. Like you had a beautiful 16 years together, you know, and you can still hold that, you know, you can still hold that that was true and also, you know, understand that it needed to end. Yeah. Um, and it was very, very poignant and moving for me because I was really struggling with that. I was just like, this is, you know, like I was like, it, it had to have been bad. It had to have been bad because if it wasn't, you know, why was it ending? Which is just part of our, 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 you know, monogamous, you know, till death do you part kind of culture is, you know, relationships ending is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's some kind of moralistic failure, you know, on the people that are involved. And it's like, no, like, you know, literally no relationship lasts forever. They all end. Um, and so why do we, you know, we need to change this, this uh, story that we're telling that, you know, somebody did something wrong, somebody failed, you know, because they couldn't arrive at, at forever. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a super amazing point and, and analogy. I was just kind of, as you were talking through that, I was thinking of a, a similar analogy of like, you said shelf life and, and I think of food, right. And like you've, you're, you're now sitting been eating something that's expired, but you've been eating it like it got a little expired and you kept eating it and then it got a little worse. And so like you kind of adjust to the taste. And then finally your husband's like, like this food tastes like shit. Like why are we still eating this expired food? And we're food? getting sick. Yeah, and we're getting <laughs> sick. Yeah. So, so now we're, we're in the bathroom puking together and you're like, yeah, but I don't know. Like I just need to keep eating it. And, and okay, so now you're going to get rid of it, but you don't have to look back and be like, well, this food wasn't always shit for like, the whole time like it tasted good that's why we bought it and that's why it was good for a very long time so i think yeah it's so hard because you get in there and and it took one of you right it took him to kind of be like look like we're not happy we got to do something different and you are going to like you said you're going to ride this thing until the wheels fall off and like yeah you'll never let it go and so i that's so hard and i just thank you for sharing that and being vulnerable about it because it's a that's a tough journey and I don't know that we've had anybody really talk about it in that way of yeah. like, you yeah. know, we, we know like, yeah, we could sit here and go non-monogamy is the reason, but like not in the sense that like people want to like vilify it. Like it, it exposes, yeah. it exposes it, what needed to be exposed. And I, I well, think and that's who, important. Who know, like you said, there might be an alternate yep. reality, right? Like who knows what would have happened if you hadn't gone down the non-monogamous -monog route and been yeah. stayed monogamous, like it, who knows what yeah. would have happened anyway. So, and, and not only that, th it, the narrative that it is better to remain in an unfulfilling relationship. Cause, mm -hmm. cause if you think about that, it's like, okay, so say we didn't go non-monogamous and we stayed together, but our relationship while it was good and we love one another, it wasn't, like it wasn't truly fulfilling for either of us. Mm -hmm. And so people would have been okay with us staying in this relationship that wasn't really truly fulfilling for either of us. Then for us saying, you know, why don't we seek true fulfillment? You know? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, so to me, like in a way, you know, that is a blessing. It, it showed us that like, Hey, like real authentic fulfillment in relationship is available. Maybe not with this person that you're with, but it is available. And why would I not want that? Not only for myself, but also for a person that I, I claim to care about and love. Right. And, and that actually is interesting in, uh, in being non-monogamy and having a breakup of that magnitude happen is because like I, you know, so my husband has a partner um, that he's been with now. I think they're going on five years. Um, she's a wonderful human being. And they are MFEO. Okay. They are made for each other. Like, I, like it, to the point where like, I can't even get angry, you know, about it, you know, because I'm just like, they're just so perfect for each other. I remember I, I called her to uh, right after we woke up to kind of let her know like, Hey, cause she and I had a friendship and I was like, Hey, you know, I need to let you know you know, uh, Kevin and I are breaking up or whatever. And, uh, and she was like, yeah, she was like, a, you know, I kind of know. She said, he did mention it to me. She said, but he didn't go into detail. She was like, which I think is appropriate. And I was in my mind, I was just like, God, they are so made for each other because <laughs> you know, like that's exactly the way he would have been about it. Cause she's also super private. And so, um, and so, yeah. And so like, it was very hard. And I, and I imagine that he experienced this too, although he's not as, um, you know, open about his thoughts and feelings of like watching this person be in this relationship that you can tell is way more suited for them. And like having this person 
choosing others in a way that they're no longer choosing you, you know? So it's like, I'm choosing to remain in relationships because it's not like he broke up with me and he broke up with everybody. You know, he broke up with me, but he continued on with the other people that he was with. And so having to go, you know, he, he's still continuing. It's, it's not that he doesn't want romantic relationships at all. He just doesn't want one with me. And, um, and how difficult that was. Like I, t- I told people, I said, it felt like a rejection to my core, you know, to the core of my being, because, you know, he's, it's, he's engaging in these kinds of interactions with other people. Um, he just doesn't want to do that with me anymore. And so it was, it was really challenging kind of going through a breakup, you know, from a non-monogamy space of still having to, and still having to show up to him having other relationships with other people, you know, while, you know, we were de-escalating um, uh, ours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And that's so, so easy to, to like internalize that and be like, well, it's obviously me. me. And, <laughs> and to be honest, it's not just you, it's you and him and it's a you and him compatibility. Right. And it, it's not like on that day, all of your partners came to you and were like, well, Evita, we're all leaving you today because of you. Right. And like you said, like his, his fit with her was with his other partner was better. And, but that's still like that, that hits you really deep. And I, yeah, and I'm fortunate enough that I had a partner at the time. I know it would have definitely been a lot harder if I didn't. You know, right. so I'm just keeping it real. Yeah. Um. But uh. But I did have a partner at the time, and my partner, and actually, so my husband said to me, um, he said he no longer believes in the idea that relationships should feel hard. That's what he said. He was like, I no longer subscribe to the notion that relationships should feel hard. He said, yes, there are hard moments and there's work that you have to do, but they shouldn't feel hard. And we always had a hard relationship, always had a hard relationship. And when he said it was one of those things, those moments where I'm like, why are you doing this? And then when he said it, I was like, okay, okay, I get it. Okay, okay. Because my relationship with my partner that I had at the time was so easy. So, so, so easy. We had such, we have such ease. We've been together now for two years such ease not to say that we don't have conflict that we don't struggle to understand one another at times that we don't have to work towards you know you know getting on the same page and all of those things but the relationship itself feels easy it is such it's so easy it is so easy to love him it is so easy to feel loved by him so easy and so when my husband said that i was like yep i understand (laughs) yeah i was like okay i'll I'll give you that i'll give you that but it, it took you like thinking about your other relationship to really understand it. Yeah, it did. When he said that, I was like, okay, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah. Because I, I, I had that experience, you know, I, of being in this relationship that, that there was just ease and lightness, you know, and, and even when we went to conflict, you know, they didn't go as, as, as harshly as it did um, uh, with my uh, uh, husband, we had like very harsh conflict. Um, and, and I don't think it came from a place of either one of us trying to hurt the one another, but we were literally always coming from these two completely different vantage points. And so it felt like we were trying to cross so much ground, you know, to get to, to, to one another. Um, whereas, and so, you know, being in conflict with him always kind of felt like a cage match, you know, to where it was like, we were both opponents on two sides of the, you know, the field. And because we had been together for such a long time, it was such a deeply ingrained pattern, mm-hmm. you know, that even that, that it was just, it was like second nature. As soon as we got into conflict, it was like, okay, ding, 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 everybody get to your corners. You know what I mean? And that was just the way it, the way it, it, it always went. Whereas when I got in relationship with my current partner, um, you know, he introduced conflict to me that wasn't hostile. And before that, I didn't know that that was even possible. Mm-hmm. Um, until I got into relationship with him. And I was like, oh, it's possible to have conflict. And I believe that that same thing happened for my husband with his other partner. Is he was like, oh, it's possible for us to be in conflict with one another and for it to not be hostile. And so then it became, well, what is it about us, you know, uh, that, that, that happens? Um, and the, the, you know, the answer to that question was that we're just not compatible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, I think it's a really... Uh, pointing conversation, important conversation. Um, so I appreciate that. I think there's a, a ton of amazing stuff in there and, and like super powerful. And I think one thing that I wanted to pick out a little bit, and then I know we've, we've talked for over an hour and we want to give you your afternoon. And, but I think the, 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 the mentality of like deescalating the relationship with your husband and you said early on in this interview that like, you're really focusing on co-parenting for like the last year, year and a half. And like, 
the the notion, I guess, as Emma said, like just because a relationship ends doesn't mean it's a failure. Doesn't mean it has to be a, a horrible thing. Doesn't mean you have to go to your separate corners and duke it out, right? Like, so how, how has that looked for you and your husband, like to deescalate, co-parent, be amicable, and like, have you found a better like relationship framework that like you do thrive in at this point? So I wouldn't say that we're at Thrive Space yet. Um, uh, It is not hostile. Um, It is not uh, uh, tense. But it is awkward and uncomfortable. (laughs) I will say that. It is awkward and uncomfortable. Um, There's a lot of hurt there. I will say that. Uh, There's a lot of hurt there. I I, um, showed up in a lot of ways that I am now aware um, were very, very damaging and harmful. um, And some were even abusive, you know. Um, And I can own that. Um, and while I did a lot of work to no longer be that person anymore, you know, the damage is done, you know? And so, um, and so, uh, you know, when we broke up, I remember, interestingly enough, I had watched this like free masterclass, uh, from Catherine Woodward Thomas on conscious uncoupling. And I bought the book just going, this would be good for me to have in my work, you know, cause by that time I was, um, coaching and doing peer support and things of that nature. So I'm like, I'm gonna be dealing with people that have breakups and stuff and, and, you know, in the non-monogamous community, there's a big, you know, focus on trying to have amical breakups, especially because the community is so small, yep. you know, so you may break up with somebody and be at a meetup, you know, with your ex and their new person. And so learning how to to uh, break up in a way that allows you to maintain relationships with people. So I was like, oh, this is probably a good idea for me to read this book, not knowing that I would end up reading it for myself in a few months. And so, so I, you know, I was reading this book and what I noticed that I was doing in my breakup with him is I was doing the same thing I actually did to get in relationship with him was I was being very pushy, you know? And so I was like, okay, so now we got to figure out how to be in this friend space, you know? And so I'm like, okay, we broke up, we broke up, and now we got to be friends, you know? Yeah. And so I'm like, how do we do this? How do we do this? And um, and he just was not there. He was not there. He, he, he wasn't there. He needed his space. He did. He needed his space. And like I said, it wasn't volatile. You know, we had a couple of, you know, dicey moments, not gonna lie. And, uh, and you know, I did struggle, but it wasn't, it wasn't volatile. Um, But it also wasn't friendly for a long time. And, you know, and that was a largely, you know, kind of him of going like, you know, I really just don't, I don't really want that with you right now. And at first it was really challenging for me because I was like, well, how are we going to raise these kids? And this is that. And I I very much was very concerned about my image, actually, in a way that I don't normally find myself uh, because I'm I'm very much a, you know, this is who I am. You like me, you like me, you don't, you don't. But I found myself feeling really concerned about my image and and needing to us to, you know, get to this friendship space so that people could see that we could do this. And that also I, I needed that from him because I felt like him not wanting to be in this friendship space to me, like basically said that I was a terrible person, you know, and that's what he thought about me, you know? And so I like needed this validation from him. Tell me that I wasn't a terrible person, that you don't hate me, you know, by being my friend. Um, but that, what that did was it made me be very pushy in a way that, um, that, you know, just wasn't helpful to the situation. And he didn't really want to process a lot of the breakup with me. He just, he, he had no desire to do it. You know, he didn't, I, I wanted to talk about it and talk about our feelings. I never pushed back against it. And how do we work this out? And, you know, can we try again? I never did that. Once he kind of said we were done, I accepted it. But I very much was like, all right, now we got to figure out how to be friends. And he was just like, I'm just not there. Um, and so I had to give myself time. I had to go, you know what, Vita, it's too soon. Mm-hmm. You know, it's too soon. I had to, you know, uh, you know, we had to create distance. We were living in the same house together for a really long time. It was a pandemic. Neither one of us were in a place where we could move out. Um, we both were unemployed. Like it was just a bad situation all around. He eventually ended up uh, moving in with his parents. I, I moved back across the country um, in with my mom. Um, and once we created space and we created distance um, uh, and kind of went to our corners, so to speak, to kind of do our own healing, you know, now we're at the place where I feel like maybe some of like the the comfortability is returning. Some of the uh, uh, the um, familiarity is is kind of returning, uh, but it took time mm-hmm. um, and it took, you know, allowing that to happen, that process to happen and and not kind of pushing. Because I feel like sometimes that happens, too, when people break up is one person is a little bit pushier, you know, than the other person. Um, if they want to, you know, they want to have a friendship. We got to figure out how to be friends. 
Yeah. Um, and um, and sometimes you just need time for that. You just need time for that. And so um, and so that's what I've been, uh, you know, kind of focusing on is focusing on my own healing, you know, identifying the ways I, that I was in relationship with him that uh, didn't work for me. And I don't want to replicate moving forward, identifying all the ways that I lost myself in that relationship. Like I find all of these pieces of myself that are coming back online in ways that like I didn't even know were doled um, down. Uh, and so like, that's been an interesting work. And then also what's been interesting is now I'm, I'm, I'm operating in non-monogamy, uh, without an anchor when before I had always had an anchor partner, you know, so now I'm like single, you know, even though I have partners, you know, I'm single moving through non-monogamy in a way that I, I never was. And, and, and that totally, totally changes how you feel about non-monogamy and how you gauge in relationships when you don't, you're not moving from that space. It, it's a completely yeah. different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And yeah. do you, no, go ahead. I was going to say like the time piece is such an important um, recognition that you, you have to sometimes just be patient. Um, mm -hmm. well, well, and it sounded too, like you, similar to our compersion conversation, there were all these, these, poly overlords telling you like well now you got to be friends and you're like shit i'm not there and he's like i'm not there and you're like but we have to be that's what everyone says we have to do and it's like yeah but like what no. works for you right what works for you yeah. right i even had to reevaluate for myself like if if i remove the fact that we have all this history and we have these kids together is this someone that i would want to be friends with right does this person have what I value for friendship. You know, I had to ask myself that question because I was going, well, we have these kids and we've been married for all this time. And so we have to figure out how to have a friendship. But I was like, Bavita, do you even want to be this person's friend? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And that's a really, I mean, talk about a hard fucking question to ask yourself. Right. Somebody that you were married to for many years. And, yeah. and yeah, like that's a, that's an impossible one to ask. Yeah. And, and to, yeah. and to be honest with yourself, yeah. you, you mentioned too in there that you, you found parts of yourself that were dulled out coming back online. Can you talk a little bit about that? And maybe like one or two things, if you're comfortable sharing that, like you felt come back alive after this. Cause I think that's just such a powerful thing to have said. And I didn't want to like miss it. Yeah. Um, so I'm an extremely sensitive person. I feel I have a lot of emotions and my husband was totally the reverse. Like uh, I used to like, I used to call him a robot. I mean, it's not nice, but you know, I used to say like, you know, don't worry, Gato, Mr. Robato, you know, cause he was just very emotionally cut off. You know, like we had this little joke that, you know, in order for him to access his emotions, he had to charter a ferry and go out to emotion Island, you know, right. <laughs> to kind of get to his emotions. Whereas like for me, my emotions in the shower with me, they at the dinner table, you know, they're everywhere. And so I had learned to, to, to suppress feeling because I'm in this relationship with this person who's just not emotionally connected at all and is not someone that I can connect to on emotion. And so I began to notice uh, after being out of relationship for, uh, with him for a while, how much more sensitive I am. So I'll hear some music and I'll, it'll make me weep, you know, or I'll, I'll like I'm, I'm reading nonviolent communication. I was talking to one of my partners because he loves nonviolent communication. So, you know, I'm giving him updates um, on, you know, my process as I'm reading through it. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to get through this book without crying <laughs> you know, because like every <laughs> chapter, something happens where I'm just like, I need to be more compassionate, you know, so and um, and so, yeah, so like my sensitivity is coming back online. Um, uh, you know, my sense of adventure um, is, is, and I always was a pretty adventurous person, but, you know, I lived in this relationship with this person that I kind of had to check this against, whereas like now I don't have that. So like that's, you know, coming back online, you know, um, like, you know, uh, even just how I want to exist in my home, um, you know, because my husband was so much quieter, you know, than I was. So I'm the type of person and you can wake up in the morning to me singing at the top of my lungs, cooking in the kitchen, you know, and he was just a much quieter person. So, um, and so like, I'm noticing these ways to where like, I, I kind of either like I lost parts of myself or they just, they got a little, uh, uh, a cloudy, you know, mm -hmm. they yeah. got a little cloudy and, and we do that when we're in close proximity to one, to a person because, you know, we're trying to exist alongside them harmoniously, you know? Right. Uh, you know, but sometimes we, 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 you know, we go too far. You know, the best relationships are ones where we can be as close to who we authentically are as possible and still be in harmony with that person that we're walking alongside. 
Um, and that relationship, because of just how different we were, that just was not, you know, that was not possible uh, for us to really exist harmoniously alongside each other without one of us, you know, severely alter- altering, you know, um, who they were as a person um, in order to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I know some of that was probably kind of vulnerable. So thank you for for sharing that. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I guess kind of related to that, I know we're going to wrap up shortly because this has gotten to be a very long conversation. Uh, but it doesn't feel like it, though. No, it does not. Flown by. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you had mentioned a while back that you like swinging really worked with you for you. That was, you know, fit your personality, fit who you were. And then you went and um, started polyamory and started having relationships with people. And now it seems like that also works for you. So could you talk a little bit about your growth there and how, where you're at now with, with relationships and, and what finding what works? So, and this, you know, I'm going to caveat this by saying that everybody does not have to feel this way about this. This is how I feel about this. This is not how everybody has to feel about this. So I'm going to caveat this by saying this, but I kind of like swinging for me or the effect that it had on me was similar to junk food, you know, uh, good for a treat every once in a while, but a steady diet of it'll fuck you up. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I described how it landed. For me, okay, for some people, it is mother's milk. That is wonderful, okay? But for me, it was something that I recognized that I needed to do um, as a treat, you know, for Mm -hmm. myself. Uh, But I can't do a steady diet of it. And so when we got into non-monogamy, but like I said, I like having a variety of partners, you know? And so, um, uh, and so, you know, we got into polyamory and it allowed me the space to create uh, relationships with people that I was still having sex with, but there was also emotional intimacy. There was emotional care, you know, other things that I like having in in addition to uh, being sexual with a person, um, which wasn't in, wholly afforded to me um, when I was swinging. But I still enjoy swinging. I still enjoy having, you know, casual sex. I still enjoy having recreational sex. I still enjoy going to parties and going to clubs and all of those things are still things that I enjoyed. And so it afforded me the opportunity to be able to engage in both of those things um, at the same time. And so I still absolutely swing on occasion. I still absolutely engage in casual sex. Those are all things that I do. Uh, But um, I also uh, have the freedom to uh, have more, you know, uh, with people that I feel um, I want more with. Um, And I also, you know, engage in that as well. So, um, and I definitely don't judge swinging. I feel like there's a lot of judgment of swinging in the non-monogamous community. Um, there's a whole, whole, whole lot of judgment um, as if almost, you know, getting to polyamory is like a graduate space uh, and where I'm just like, no, like, you know, that's not the way it is. Um, you can absolutely, or there's even, a, um, I, I've, I've seen some of like a leeriness of uh, polyamorous people that will still swing or that will still engage in swinging. Like, you know, there's this kind of a leeriness there as I just don't see it that way. So I'm like, you know, when I feel like just having random sex with a person, I do that. And when I meet someone that I feel like I can have a, 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 a wonderful, emotional, intimate, romantic, loving relationship with, I'm, I free myself and I have the, the, I give myself the room to do that as well. And, um, and I don't judge either of them as, as good or bad or lesser or higher, but more this met this need at this time. And this is meeting this need at this time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. I love it. Yes, I'm a little annoyed you're not going to paint yourself into a box and then criticize <laughs> everybody else who isn't in your box with you. That's pretty. That's that's so an, against human nature. I don't know. But hey. I love that you found what what works for you. At least right now, and that could always change. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I do. I will say that now I'm not as um, I don't engage in. Um, I'm a little bit more circumspect about the casual sex that I do engage in now, but that really came from um, uh, being in a much more tender space in general because of of going through my marriage uh, separating and just the different things that I have going on in life. And then also wanting to have different sexual experiences. Um, so what I find sometimes, especially as you're interacting with you know people out in the normie world or you're a woman interacting with men generally, people struggle with uh, having casual sex that isn't callous. Mm-hmm. And so like, and so now I'm not as um, uh, uh, promiscuous um, as I used to be. And that, that's not a judgment at all. Cause I'm, I, I tell people I'm a whole slut, you know, and I love being a slut. And so that's, that's, you know, that's not a judgment at all, but um, I, I am a little bit more intentional 
mm-hmm. about the sex that I engage in than I was um, in the past. And that's just caused me to have to slow down a little bit because I apply a little bit more thought yeah. uh, to it than I did before. But it, it's not it doesn't come from a place of me judging casual sex is wrong. And I do absolutely still engage in it, you know, when I feel like um, it's it's what I want to do. But I, 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 I'm in a space right now of sexual exploration where I'm, I'm bringing a lot more intention into the choices that I make. And because of that, it just causes me to have to slow down in a way that I, I didn't in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that as well. And when you say callous, the thing that came to my mind was like, we've heard people and we've actually had people say similar things to us um, in in the past of like, you'll have sex and you'll like lay down to like cuddle with them for a minute afterwards. So like come down from the experience. It's like, oh, 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 we don't cuddle. Like we can have sex, but like no cuddling or no this or no. And you're like, okay, like now I you don't feel good in that moment. And I, I don't know if that's what you were kind of getting at with callous, but that's sort yeah, of what kind yeah, of popped into my mind. Yeah, this, things like that or people, I feel like people make assumptions that if they engage in other forms of intimacy or other forms of care and tenderness, that that means that it's going to develop feelings. Yeah. And I don't necessarily feel like it, it, it might even be a safeguard for themselves, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, to where they're like, I can't do this because if I do this, then I'm going to start developing feelings. And that's why it's important to have conversations about like, hey, what are you comfortable with? What are you not comfortable with? What are we going to do? What are we not going to do? Like, are you open to cuddling afterwards? So that way the person's like, no, I don't really do that. Then you can kind of go, okay, well, I probably shouldn't sleep with that person because I know that that's something that I need. Because um, I think that there's this this fear in casual sex of well, what if what if feelings develop? What if we develop feelings? Whereas like, I'm, I'm not really afraid of that space. Um, I'm definitely one that can engage in casual sex with a person. And even if I felt myself developing feelings, I can kind of walk myself back down to where it is that we're supposed to be. It's like, okay, like you're developing feelings, but Vita, this is not what's happening in this space. Right. Walk yourself back down or I can create boundaries around like, maybe I won't interact with that person as much as I was, you know what I mean? To give myself a place to resettle. Um, but I think a lot of that comes from this, like, oh no, what if feelings develop? And so we have to kind of almost do these very assholy things to kind of like, assert Mm -hmm. that feelings are not supposed to be here. Um, but we end up actually hurting people. Um, and you know, why would I, why would we open up our bodies to a person, um, that we didn't feel cared about us as a human being, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's like my new work now is like, just because I'm engaging in casual sex with a person, I still want to feel cared about as a human being. Mm -hmm. And I want to care for you as a human being. Um, and so, you know, how do we do that? How do we uh, interact with people to where it's like, yeah, no, we're not trying to figure out, you know, if, you know, we're the next Nicholas Sparks, you know, uh, a story. Um, but, you know, can we come together and, 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 and pleasure one another's bodies and de-stress with one another and bring each other joy and happiness and then send the other person off um, and, you know, you know, want them to do well, but not necessarily be trying to, you know, uh, uh, make an actual relationship with them. Yeah. 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 And that's a, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No. I was just saying, that's a great point. Like, because I, when I said that, you know, you kind of balanced out what I was, what I was thinking, which is like, almost this negative piece of like, well, Jesus, if we cuddle, it's not like we're going to end up married next week. But you know what? I don't know what that person, like, maybe that's what for them, that's, that's where it goes, they right? They, so for them, they, like you said, they need to do it to protect themselves. But I think then where you got, which is like, let's have that conversation before we're having sex. So we know after we finish what we can expect. Like if, if I'm expecting to cuddle and the other person's already packed their bag and they're in the, they're out the door and you're like, your head's spinning from it. Like, it's good to have that expectation going into it. So, mm-hmm. right. I, and I think it's important to not personalize it. And we do that a lot, especially mm-hmm. in that space. Cause it's so vulnerable, you know, yeah. we personalize and we yeah. go, okay, well, this person didn't do this cause they don't like me or they're an you know, asshole. But like, and, and that was something that I had to, you know, kind of sit with is going, I don't know if this person is doing that because they struggle. Mm -hmm. with the development of feelings and they don't want to do that. And so that that's how they safeguard themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that. I really don't know that. And I actually won't know that if I don't have the conversations, but also I need to not personalize that and just go, okay, you know, I probably shouldn't be sleeping with this person, you know? So that'll be the last time that we do that because I need someone that is open to cuddling with me after sex. That's a need that I have. Um, Or even just asking the person say, Hey, you know, when we left, um, uh, you know, when we got done, you, you put your clothes on, you just kind of left. And I would have liked for us to have cuddled, you know, is that something that is that, is that available? Cause they may have felt like, you know, cause that, th- that space is kind of awkward. I've definitely had that awkward moment where I slept casually with someone and now you're laying there and you're like, 
Should what I do get I do up? Next? Yeah. What's, <laughs> what's next? <laughs> are they, are they, are they wanting me out the door? Like, uh, you know, that awkward space where you're just like, I don't know really what to do. So you don't know if they bolted out the door. Cause they were like, okay, this is casual. You know, I don't think this person wants to do this with me. Let me just run and put my clothes on and leave, you know? So having a conversation, I uh, sex, I'm a big fan of sex debriefs, sex debrief debrief this is what worked for me this is what didn't work for me if we do this again this is what i'd like to see you know (laughs) moving forward is this something that we can bring online you know i'm a big i'm a big proponent of sex debrief so debrief talk to the person say hey i would have liked to have cuddled was that something that you're open to because you might they they might surprise you and be like i wanted to cuddle too but i didn't think you wanted to do that with me like you don't know yeah so make sure that we're communicating right yeah Mm -hmm. that's a great recommendation uh the debrief yes um um, couldn't agree more there. It's just why not communicate about it? It makes things, it could be awkward in the moment, but it makes, it could be less awkward in the future if you talk about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Evita, for everything. Um, we could keep talking to you for hours and actually- yeah, we keep saying, we're going to wrap up and then 40 minutes goes by. <laughs> right, right. And we're like, well, look at us just chatting away. People listening are going to be like, well, I told they said I they were going to- lot. <laughs> right, they were going to wrap up and they haven't wrapped up. So speaking of that, we um, we will- we would love to have you back on and continue the conversation. Uh, but before we let you go today, we'd love for you to talk about where people can find you and the work that you do. And if you have anything else to share. Um, so you can find me on Instagram at Levita Loca 34. I do a mostly daily polyamory reminder. I also just post relationship things in general. I'm actually surprised at the amount of monogamous people that follow me. I have quite a few followers that are monogamous because they're like, this is just good relationship content, <laughs> you know? Yep. Um, and so, um, and so yes, yeah, so you can find me on Instagram at Levita Loca 34. You can find me on Facebook at Levita Loca Sawyers. And um, those are the two main platforms that I post to. Um, I have a TikTok and a Twitter, but I never use it. And so I, 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 to the point where I don't even know what the actual name is. Um, <laughs> but uh, Levita Loca 34 on Instagram, uh, uh, Levita Loca Sawyers on uh, Facebook. I do polyamory content. Um, I talk about relationships. I talk about different things having to deal with, you know, queerness, blackness, um, a little less frequently. Um, and I, and one of the things that I really do that people appreciate is I don't just talking head at people. I will literally be like, so I got jealous the other day because my partner was blah, 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 blah. So I, I talk about my personal experience and the things that I go through. I think that's something that gets lost, especially as people become um, uh, older and non-monogamy um and you know they don't talk they 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 talk about these things from this removed place mm-hmm. because it's like oh well i've been doing this for 10 years so of course you know i'm not getting jealous anymore but i'm like no i, I got jealous two days ago you know yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> and i i think that that helps to humanize uh uh me and then also humanize my listeners my willingness to go now like you know i mean i don't always have all the answers you know my feelings aren't always where i want them to be all the time um and that's okay yeah mm-hmm. Yeah. I think being able to be honest about it and like you said, show the good, the bad, the indifferent, the honest, the honest self, like that's because it's right. You, I think it gives people that frame, that, that frame of reference that like the first time there's a, there's a hiccup that you don't like throw the whole thing out the window because like, well, should everybody in the Facebook group says they're great. So like, I'm supposed to be great and it didn't feel good today. So I must not be good at this. So we should, just, we'll just be done. Right. I'm telling Facebook is a highlight reel, you know, so I, I used to m- make this joke all the time. You know, people be posting the pictures, you know, oh, me and my metamor and, you know, my partner were hanging out. I said, never mind that after they posted the picture, so-and-so got in their feelings because the partner was standing closer to one than the other person and they ended up getting in a fight about it and uh, it ruined the whole day. And uh, one person went home like, you know, what I mean, but they ain't going to post that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> all, all because all of the, see is the smiley picture. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. I, I'll post that. I'll be like, uh, so after we posted that picture, okay, <laughs> we melted down. But yeah, but people don't think about that. It's just like, oh, everybody's smiling in these great polycules. Never mind, you know that they had just gotten in an argument, you know, you know, a couple hours beforehand. Right. But they're not, you know, people aren't talking about that stuff, and and yeah. and that's okay. They don't have to. But I do feel like sometimes we do the community a disservice because, like you said, somebody has a hiccup, and then they're like, "Well, clearly I must be bad at this because nobody else is going through this with me." They're feeling so alienated and so isolated and alone. And so part of why I'm so open about you know my genuine experience of it is because I love people reaching out and go, "I thought I was the only one that felt that way." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. If well, if you think you're the only one who's ever gotten upset because of a selfie, you're not. Right? <laughs> I think that's the that's the moral of the story. 
Um, there. I, yeah. I love it. And I, I can't wait to talk to you again. And I know we talked, we had a little mini sidebar in the middle of this that nobody got to hear, but we're excited to do this again. And I don't know what we'll talk about, but I don't think there's any shortage of conversations that we could have together. And, and I'm excited for it. And I yes. imagine... Emma is equally. Oh, thrilled. definitely. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for being so open and honest and just for sharing everything that you did today. It was amazing. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for having me on this opportunity. This was a great conversation. I feel like I could talk to y'all forever too. So, um, <laughs> and I'd love to love to come back because this was a great conversation. So thank yeah. you so much for having me. Of course. Well, we can't wait to do it again and have a fantastic day. You too. And we're back. A huge thank you again to Evita for coming on the show and being vulnerable with us and everything that you shared and also all the amazing work that you do out there. Um, we're so grateful and so excited to share this episode with everyone. And again, links to everything that Evita has done and is doing are in the show notes uh, at normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Just click on the podcast tab or uh, you can click. There's a direct link in your podcast player. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Evita. <laughs> a quick reminder to find out information about our Patreon community, the upcoming in-person events that we have, or the upcoming virtual events that we have, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. You can find all of the information there. We'd also love for you to reach out to us, send us a voicemail, send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. And if you're heading out into the world and meeting people again, which... Yay, we can start thinking about doing that. It's I super know. exciting. Uh, we highly recommend and we would love it if you would join us in being amazing sexual health ambassadors. The way that Emma and I do that, we get tested for STIs using a service called stdcheck.com. They have been a long term affiliate partner of the podcast and we absolutely love what they do. It's a service we use and love ourselves. You get a 10 panel test uh, for about $130. If you use the links on our website, you save $10 and you help support the show financially. So we're extremely grateful to anyone and everyone who has done that and who is going to do that after they listen to this. So it's super fast. It's super easy. Again, it's our favorite way to get tested. And we've gotten a ton of feedback from others that they love it as well. So if you're in the market for some STI testing, check it out, see if it's right for you. And thank you for supporting the show and you're welcome for saving $10. Yes. Thank you so much. Next week, we have our regularly scheduled interview on Wednesday with CJ. We're super excited about this one as well. So come back in a week and check it out. And in the meantime, we'd love to see you at the in-person events in San Diego this week. So don't forget about those. Is yes. that it? Yep. We'll see everybody in a week. Bye everyone. Thanks for listening.